Thanks again, Ron, for helping us. We began a, a new series of messages uh, today um, that we're calling Christ Encounter. And I, I want to, at the very beginning, say thanks to, to Keith, who has assisted us uh, with uh, some graphic design. By the way, if you're heading to the children's worship time, feel free to, to depart. I, you know, I joke with you all about the fact that you look a little wistful when they leave, kind of thinking it might be better where they're going than it is in here, but... It's okay. We, uh, we will not be here too long. I remember what a seminary professor once said to me, um, to have eternal significance, a sermon does not have to be everlasting in length. That's a pretty good statement, isn't it? I heard that, amen. I don't know who did said that. But. We begin a series of messages today about Christ's encounter, and it'll take us through the months of June and uh, into July, maybe early August, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine weeks, something like that. Um, this morning, we're going to look at a passage from the third chapter of John's Gospel, uh, the first 15 verses. Uh, I'll be sharing this passage with you from the New International Version of the Bible. And, um, this is an encounter Christ had with a Jewish leader, a man by the name of Nicodemus. Uh, if you're able, uh, in honor of the reading of God's Word, would you stand with me uh, as we hear together today uh, the truth? Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of the Spirit Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Nicodemus asked, how can this be? You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and yet you do not understand these things. I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into the heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And although the passage itself does not end there, this is where we will conclude our consideration for the morning. Would you pray with me? Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts and our minds, be pleasing and acceptable to you through Christ Jesus our Lord, in whose precious name we pray. Amen. Be seated. Thank you. A number of years ago, I read a story about a, a little jazz club in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, it was a place where guest artists came and they performed. It, it was kind of a, a launching pad for individuals who had dreams of someday being either jazz singers or jazz players. In this little club, there was an old dilapidated piano. It was a spinet slammed up against the wall. The outside of it was just as ugly as it could be. It was scarred and it was marred, but the insides didn't work very well either. Several of the keys stuck. It was out of tune, and everyone who came and tried to play the piano complained about it. Until finally one day the owner of the club became aggravated enough with all of the complaints that he decided to do something about it. He hired a young man to come in and to paint the piano so that it looked better. But that was all that happened. Nothing on the inside was changed. On the outside it looked great. 
But on the inside, it still didn't work. That was Nicodemus. On the outside, he was painted and perfect. But on the inside, there was something still lacking. Something he was missing. He was a member of the ruling council, and that meant he was a significant man in, in the eyes of his own social context. He was seen as a leader, as a man who knew the teachings of Scripture. And yet something in this man yearned for something else. It's an interesting passage, this conversation which occurs between Jesus and between Nicodemus. It seems to me in many ways that Nicodemus was tired of living by rules and came to the point of understanding that rules are never enough. Spiritual life, the dynamic of life and faith, has to do with relationship. Our relationship to God the Father and most significantly and importantly, our relationship to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So in his restlessness, Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and uh, John tells us that he came at night. Now, scholars through the years, as, as is typical of, of biblical scholars, have, have theorized about why Nicodemus came at night. The most obvious explanation is that he was afraid. He didn't want any of his colleagues to see him talking to this young rabbi from the northern country of Nazareth. I'm not sure I'm real comfortable with that because later on, in terms of his own personal journey, Nicodemus shows himself to be a man of incredible courage, particularly as you look at the events surrounding the crucifixion, the burial, and eventually the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But that's, that's another story. Others believe he came at night, other scholars believe he came at night to avoid complicating the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He did it out of consideration. You know, if Jesus were talking to a prominent Jewish leader from the city of Jerusalem, it might not reflect all that positively on him because already he was engaging in some actions that were bringing him into conflict with the religious hierarchy of his day. Already, Christ was pretty controversial. The most fascinating explanation I've read, though, and the one which I ascribe to for no other reason than I like it the most, is that nighttime was the time when rabbis studied the Torah. They couldn't do much during the day because they had family and personal obligations that kept them busy. So it was not at all unusual for a rabbi, for a Pharisee, even a Sadducee, to take a lantern back to his study area, a little oil lamp, and to open the scrolls of the law and to begin the study of the law at night, looking at it in depth for purposes of instruction and edification. Now, isn't that a fascinating possibility when you think about it? That as Nicodemus is perhaps reading one of the prophets of the Old Testament, perhaps even the prophet Isaiah, he came across passages that piqued his interest and that somehow perhaps he was able to link with the ministry and the witness of this young rabbi from Nazareth. When he came to Christ at night, and, and we don't know why exactly Nicodemus came at night. The scripture is silent regarding that issue. But wouldn't it be fascinating if he came because out of a study of the law, he came to see something of a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ himself and decided he needed to go and to learn more and to understand more and to glean more knowledge. When he comes to Christ, he makes an interesting statement. He said, we know that you come from God. And the term for know in the original language is oida, O-I-D-A, and it means a settled conviction of the heart based on observation and personal experience. Fascinating, isn't it? Th that this man who knew the law of Moses from cover to cover came to Christ and said, Christ, I know that you come from God. My heart tells me that. 
My powers of observation tell me that. The ministry that you're already performing would indicate to me and to many of us that you are sent from God. And then there is this wonderful conversation which ensues, and it's this conversation this morning that I want us to think about together for just a few moments and the lessons we can learn from this conversation. The first thing I would like you to to think about with me for just a moment is this. It's important for us to understand that Jesus Christ does not reject us just because we sometimes misunderstand what he is trying to teach us, what he is trying to share with us, what he's trying to say to us. The early part of this passage is, um, well, there's a keystone cop element to it. It seems like Nicodemus is sort of looking at a blank wall and he doesn't quite understand. Jesus starts out by saying, let me just tell you this, you must be born again. Well, immediately he goes into a physical reality dynamic. How can I be physically born again? I'm too big to be rebirthed by my mother. So how can I be reborn? And then there is this unfolding conversation which takes place, which is to me just utterly and completely fascinating. I wish we had time to go through every single exchange and talk about it in some depth and detail. The thing you need to notice about this passage, though, and and about this conversation at its beginning is this. Jesus deals directly and forcefully with Nicodemus. He doesn't cover up the truth. He doesn't try to hide reality, and yet he never rejected him. It's pretty obvious that Nicodemus is having a hard time getting his head around the spiritual truth that Christ is trying to teach him. But Jesus never, ever rejects him. But, you know, Nicodemus wasn't alone in this journey. I mean, think about the other individuals close to Christ who had a hard time grasping the truth, too. Think about Thomas. Think about Simon Peter. Think about Judas Iscariot. Nicodemus was, by calling, by vocation, a wordsmith. He took great pride in understanding what words meant. And yet, as he moves through this conversation with Christ, it's it's obvious to him that language has its limitations. For one thing, we so often miscommunicate when we speak. I'm reminded of the kind of silly story about the boy who went off to college, and uh, he... um, wrote back after he'd been there a couple of weeks, and he said, great news, feather in my cap, been elected class president of the freshman class. And then a few weeks later, he wrote again, and he said, another feather in my cap, I've been chosen to join uh, the most prestigious fraternity. And then a third communication a few weeks later, another feather in my cap, been chosen as the lead in the class play. And then just before the end of the semester, he sent one final message home and said, you need to prepare father. I've flunked out. Ask him to send money so I can get home. And his older brother wrote him back and said, father is prepared. You need to prepare yourself. He said, there will be no money. Just stick those feathers in your shoulders and fly on home. (laughs) Words can be misleading they can get us into trouble. So Jesus in this conversation begins with, in verse 3, he says, you must be born again. How can that happen, Nicodemus asks. Well, it's it's a matter, he says then in verse 5, it's a matter of being born of the water and of the Spirit. In other words, we're talking about spiritual realities here, Nicodemus. We're not talking about physical realities. We're not talking about you somehow crawling back into your mother's womb and being born again physically. We're talking about spiritual realities and dynamics. He still obviously doesn't get it. And so Christ keeps going. He says, well, it's like uh, the invisible and irresistible force and power of the wind. That's in verse 8. And then he concludes by saying, no, it's, it's, it's like the, the look of faith. As Moses lifted the bronze serpent up in the wilderness, those who looked upon that serpent were saved. We'll have more to say about that in just a moment. But you see what Christ is nudging Nicodemus to do? 
Nicodemus, if you have to perfectly understand everything about the new birth before you choose to experience the new birth, you may never know the new birth at all. Have you ever thought about the fact that in the gospel transaction which Christ engages with, with us, there is great mystery in that. We turn from our sin, we trust in him. He gives to us a new life, a new heart, a new mind, a new spirit. In fact, Paul writes about it, we are new creations. Create being a word that is used only for an act of God, something which only God can do. Nicodemus, move beyond the language of the lips. Move beyond your pharisaical orientation toward what words mean and how words touch you and, and listen to the language of the heart. Understand that the reality of faith has about it an element of mystery and wonder that you have to embrace before it becomes real to you. Most significant thing about this journey is that in in all of these efforts to help Nicodemus understand, Christ never, ever, ever rejected this man who was honestly and sincerely seeking the truth. This leads to the second thing that I think this conversation teaches us. And that is it. And, and we all understand this intuitively. We, we understand it intellectually, but it's important to affirm it. The new birth is accomplished by the power of God, not by the understanding or the intelligence of man. Both in verse 4 and in verse 9, Nicodemus asks the question, how, how, how can this happen? How can this be? It, it, it is, I think, a heartfelt and a sincere plea for direction and understanding. And and Jesus, again, is saying to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, if you have to understand it all before you allow it to happen to you, it may never happen to you at all. You see, there is about our spiritual journey an element of the unseen and, and yet powerful presence of the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bill and Craig Owen, Bill was the dad, Craig was the boy, uh, lived in California, and one day they went exploring in the Sierra Mountains, which were not far from their home. Yeah, some of you maybe have been to the Sierra Mountains, and they're covered with old mines, uh, people trying to mine for gold primarily. Well, they found an old abandoned mine, and they, they both had flashlights, both Bill and Craig, and so they started going in. At first, they were very careful, very cautious, always keeping the, the light of the entrance kind of behind them so they would know how to get out. But as they went deeper into the mine, they made more and more interesting discoveries. They discovered, for example, a full leather harness used on a horse to pull uh, the mine cart out of the mine. It was perfectly preserved, actually would have been usable. So they took that with them uh, because this was public land and they felt like they could take since they paid their taxes, they felt like they could take what they found. They went a little bit further into the mine, and they found a pile of old oak buckets. Most of them had rotted, but three or four were still serviceable and usable, and so they, they took those. They kept finding things. They found an old pickaxe. They went a little further. They found a, a, a large rail that had been used to move the, the, the mine carts on. Then all of a sudden, Bill, the dad's flashlight, just quit. It didn't go dim and stop. It just blinked out. Probably the bulb burned out. All of a sudden, they got just a little bit anxious because they had moved well past the region that they considered to be a safe region. And there were tunnels going off in every direction. And so Bill said to Craig, Son, I think maybe we need to head back toward the entrance. And so they turned around. Both of them were a little bit anxious. And as they walked, surely enough, Craig's flashlight began to grow dim. 
until just before it went out, they traded batteries. They thought Dad's batteries might still have some life in them, and it, it burned for a while, but as they went on, about 10 minutes later, trying to find their way out, that flashlight began to dim too until finally there was no light left and they were in total and complete darkness. For the first time that day, Bill said he was genuinely afraid. And they talked about it for a while and Bill said to his son Craig, he said, you know, I've always believed that when you're in a situation you can't handle personally very well, it's a good thing to pray. So they knelt on the floor of the mine and they prayed. Uh, they prayed, obviously, for deliverance. But interestingly enough, Bill also said, Lord, if this is where our life is to end, then we give our lives to you and we trust ourselves to your keeping. After they quit praying, Craig said, Dad, do you feel that? And the father said, I do. It was the slightest breeze, just, just a whisper, really. Bill thought about it for a moment, and he said, you know, it must be coming from the entrance. So they moved in the direction of the breeze, feeling their way along the edge of the tunnel, they came to another junction where several tunnels radiated out, and they stopped, got in the middle of the junction, and waited to feel the breeze. And when they felt it, they went down that tunnel. They did that for an hour, feeling their way along the wall of the tunnel, following the gentle breeze, which they just knew had to be coming from the entrance of the mine. And after an hour, they saw a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel. And they walked out of it and were saved. You know, one of the concerns I have about our world is that we live in a noisy, noisy place, don't we? You get in the car, first thing you do is you turn on the radio. You get home, first thing you do is go check your Facebook post. Um, how important is it every once in a while just to be still? To be still. And to listen for the voice of God. And to feel the prompting of the Spirit of Christ. Nudging us in the right direction. You see, in the final analysis, it's, it's, it's that reality, it's that power that accomplishes the new birth. It's not about our understanding. It's not about our creativity. It's not about our intelligence. It's about our willingness to allow God to do a work in us through faith in his son Christ, turning from our sins to trust in him and knowing this new birth about which Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. That birth is accomplished by the power of God, not a human thing. In fact, Paul said we can't ever identify it as being of human origin because if we did, we'd boast about it. No, it is the gift of God so that no man can boast. It's what God does in us and through us. It's what God does for us. You know, my encouragement to you would be pause long enough in the busyness of your life, in the cacophony of your environment, pause long enough to listen for the voice of Christ and to feel the gentle nudging of his spirit as you seek to serve him and to share him in a world that desperately needs the message that Christ has given to you to share. The last point of this conversation is, is, is an important one. And the, the last point is simply that there comes a moment, a time of choice when we must 
decide what we're going to do with Jesus. Sooner or later, all of us face a moment of decision regarding the person, the work, the identity, even the lordship of Jesus Christ. We've got to decide. At the end of this passage, verses 14 and 15, Jesus goes back to a a very familiar story from the wilderness wanderings that that Nicodemus would have known like the back of his hand. It's from Numbers 21. You remember, um, and and interestingly enough, Dwayne and I just recently were talking about the the wilderness wanderings of the Israelites and, and how how bewildered we are about the fact that after everything they see, everything they had experienced, all the plagues in Egypt, the deliverance, the parting of the Red Sea, the manna in the wilderness, the cloud at day, the fire at night, after all of that, it seems that about every two to three weeks, a new wave of grumbling emerges from amidst the people. But, you know, as we were talking about, and this is parenthetical and doesn't really have all that much to do with the sermon, but Um, as we were talking about this week, we sort of had to ask ourselves, are we really all that different from from the freed slaves? Uh, We have seen and experienced and and have known the power of God in our own lives in a very special and a very personal way, and yet, isn't it easy to complain? Uh, Isn't it frustrating that God's timetable is not our own timetable at times? Jesus talks about that experience in the wilderness. The people have been grumbling, and so God sent fiery serpents in their midst. You remember the story? And everyone who was bitten died. Well, then, interestingly enough, the people decided to repent, and they said, we're sorry, Moses. Tell God we're sorry. And so God says, fashion a serpent, kind of like the one that's biting them, out of bronze, put it on the end of a staff, lift it up, and everyone who looks on the serpent will be delivered from the poison of the vipers. Nicodemus understood that this was not some superstitious or magical thing that happened. It was not the bronze serpent that saved the people from the poison. It was their belief in the promise of God spoken through Moses. It was the look. It was looking Believing. And as a result of that faith, that confidence in the promise of God, that the poison was removed from their bodies. Now, the analogy is truly incredible, isn't it? That 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 bronze serpent was put on the end of a stick, was lifted up so that all the people could see it. And, And by the look of faith, those folks were delivered. Now Jesus says the Son of Man is also going to be lifted up. And when he is, the way in which you look at him, if you look believing that he was who he said he was, that he is who he says he is. The look of faith will forever change you. So in essence, Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, there's coming a time when like the ancient Israelites, you will have an opportunity to look at something lifted up by God And you will need to choose to believe or you will need to choose not to believe. That moment of decision. Tradition tells us that Nicodemus believed. That the look of faith saved him. I was raised in a pastor's home and... um, My dad, for some 16 years, was pastor of what was then called the Old Polytechnic Baptist Church in Fort Worth on the east side, just across the street from Texas Westland University campus. 
Um, because I was raised in, in a pastor's home, I, I, I understood from a very early age what, you know, what, what, the, what biblical terms meant. I, I understood the reality of sin. I understood what it was. And if, if I had not understood what my dad had proclaimed, my mother would have given me very strong instruction regarding what sin is. I understood what sin was. I understood that I had committed it. As a young boy about eight years of age, I came to the point of believing it was time for me to give my heart and my life to Christ. One of my favorite things to do was at the end of the Sunday evening service, I would walk by and talk to my dad as he would go to the back door and greet all the people who came on a Sunday night. And, um, and I would say, Dad, can we have a conference? And he would know what that meant. And we'd go back to his study, which was back here uh, over to the, literally behind the organ as it was situated at Polly uh, in a little, little office that he had there. And he would meet me there and, and we would talk. And, and for some weeks, almost every week, we visited and we prayed. And, and I said, I, I, I want to, I feel like I need to give my heart and my life to Christ. And Dad wanting me to be sure, not, not trying to artificially postpone uh, what was going to be for me a very real experience, uh, would say, well, we'll continue to pray, we'll continue to talk, and, and one day when it's right, um, that will happen. You will give your, your life to Christ. And one Sunday evening, I asked him to, to meet me again, and as he came in, I said, Dad, uh, he actually tells me later he had almost forgotten about having the conversation with me, but he came to leave, put his Bible down, and he saw me, and, and we had the conversation again. It came to the same conclusion. We, we will continue to talk. We'll continue to pray. It's an interesting thing. In that moment, I felt something that was close to desperation. And though eight-year-old boys aren't really supposed to cry all that much, I did the only thing I knew to do. I started crying, and I said, Dad, I, I don't want to go home tonight without knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. And he said... And one of his favorite statements was, uh, bless your heart, you won't have to. And, and we knelt by a green naugahyde sofa. It may still be in that room, I don't know, but uh, green naugahyde sofa, and, and, and I prayed to receive Christ. And, and went home that night, and it, it was as if the burden of the world had been taken off my shoulders. I'll tell you something, with all honesty, I've often doubted my effectiveness. I've often wondered how and why God uses someone as flawed and as imperfect as I am to do, to, to do some things in life. But I've never doubted the reality of that experience. Because in that moment, I felt the blowing of the Spirit of Christ, and I knew it was time to decide to say yes to him. And, and that's what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. There will come a time, Nicodemus, you'll know when it is, when the Son of Man is going to be lifted up and you will have to choose to look in faith and in trust, believing, or to say no. That's what the end result of every Christ encounter really is. Choose in whom you will believe. Choose how you will live your life. Choose the pathway on which you will walk from this day forward. It's not about human understanding. It's certainly not about human perfection because we blow it all the time. We understand that. We fall and we fail. We're fragmented and broken. But in spite of that, the power of God through Christ is made real to any and to all who will turn from their sin to trust in God's Son, believing that He is who he said he is and that he will do for us 
what he has promised to do. And so he said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Maybe in terms of the journey of your own life, you're tired of that struggle. And it's time to decide to look in faith and be changed by a power that is not your own, but comes from the very throne of God himself. So that we become, as Paul wrote, new creation. We become people only God can shape. Only God can change. Is it time for that kind of encounter for you? Father, thank you for your word and its truth. For the way in which it touches us and changes us and helps us to understand how it is we are to live. So as we come to the concluding moments of this service, Father, our prayer is that in this moment of encounter with the Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ, we would choose to make those decisions which would be pleasing to you. And if there are public commitments that need to be made this day, Father, even now prompt us to understand that that's what you want us to do. That's how you want us to respond. Maybe to trust in Christ for the first time. Maybe to recommit our lives to the Savior. Maybe to join with his church in its ministry, in its witness, in its mission. Father, if there's something you want us to do publicly today, even now, help us to understand what that is and then give us the courage and the clear sense of your presence within our hearts and in our lives to make that happen. To choose to believe, to choose to follow you. And we'll be careful, Father, to always understand that these blessings and gifts come to us not because we have earned them or because we deserve them or even because we understand them but because you and in your infinite grace bestow them upon all who believe in Jesus. So we come today believing, trusting and asking you to do in us and through us all that you desire. May we feel the gentle blowing of your spirit today May we hear your voice as you speak to us. That our lives will reflect the fact that we belong to Jesus. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Song of response is, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, number 294. There's a public commitment our Lord is leading you to share with this church family. Come quickly. We'll not tarry long as Christ's Spirit leads.